Fuck. Awesome. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump right into it. It's, it's 3 o'clock, and um, I've got a lot of material to get through to make sure that nobody asks me any questions. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is uh, Daniel Burnside. Uh, I'm going to be giving a talk today about securing code in your DevOps pipeline. Um, it's it's going to be a bit of a journey. We're going to have to cover a little bit of DevOps to begin with to make sure everyone's on the same page. And hopefully by, uh, by the end of this, everyone has a profound understanding of securing code in your DevOps pipeline, uh, as well as maybe learned a little bit about yourself. Uh, so a little bit, uh, this is my obligatory who am I slide. I've uh, been working 10 years in the cybers uh, with background in AppSec, uh, cyber analytics, incident response, bug bounties, uh, and tons and tons of paperwork. Uh, a couple of companies I've worked for, and to include the government entities, um, to include South Carolina National Guard, um, operations officer for the 125th Cyber Protection Battalion, um, and I've also been working for a couple other various government agencies in that capacity when called to duty. Um, shameless plug, and I told my boss I would do this, I really need network security engineers. Um, so if you're in that field, please let me know. Um, we, need to, we need to find some folks. Thank you. Um, so let's start off. What, what is DevOps? Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, Agile and, and all these different sort of software development frameworks, but DevOps is kind of a momentum shift in the way that we produce and push code out to production. Um, and, and at the highest possible level, DevOps is the means by which we are able to write, and develop, and push code out to production with the most minimal human intervention while writing secure, high-quality code. Um, and there's a lot of pieces to this. It's not, there's no single tool that gets you to a, a, a beautiful DevOps environment. Um, it's not a single person. It's a organizational change, and men mental shift uh, to bring collaboration between several disparate teams, specifically development, and operations, and I'll go ahead and let you figure out that that gets you to DevOps. Um, we'll also talk later on a little bit about DevSecOps, which is really the crux of the discussion, integrating security into this, um, and, and why that is such an important feature and how it allows us to push code, secure code out with minimal human intervention, which, um, you know, for those of us who are in the pen testing field, um, or those of us in the security field, really, uh, without manual touch or intervention, automation can be a little unnerving. Um, because what are we missing? What are we not finding? So uh, we will get to that discussion later. So let's, let's talk about software development in general. Um, release timelines. So in, in software development, um, when you release software, you are taking a what should be a customer demand, a, a capability for your product, and putting it out into production for the world to see and use. Uh, companies that get their product out faster, better, more secure, um, and more reliable tend to succeed. Um, companies that don't tend to fail. Um, you know, in, in the 1970s, you know, we're, we're still on mainframes. Obviously, things are going to take a little bit of time. Uh, when it gets in the 80s and 90s, we're looking at quarterly, yearly releases. When's the next, you know, Duke Nukem game coming out, right? Um, in the 2000s, we finally moved into quarterly and for kind of the more advanced companies, uh, monthly releases. Um, the 2010s, you know, we're looking at, um, and I made those words up there and not real, I promise, um, where we're actually pushing out code um, by the minutes and seconds. And, and that one down there at the bottom, that is accurate. That is an Am as a statement directly from Amazon that they push out 50 million releases a year. Um, that is one code release uh, every 0.63 seconds. So in the time that we've been talking, Amazon has been pushing out probably about 100 or so releases. Um, and those are all the way through the pipeline from development uh, to build, to test, to uh, the battery of quality assurance testing, such as user acceptance testing and all that, um, out to production and uh, and likely on a red or a uh, red black or blue green cycle. Um, so the pace of releases is, is reaching a breakneck speed. Amazon is at the top of the game right now, truly. Uh, Netflix uh, is is really big in this field as well. And shockingly, uh, one of the kind of founders of of the DevSecOps philosophy, one of the companies that really kind of kicked it off a good bit as well as Etsy, out of nowhere. Um, but they apparently had a real crack team that, that pulled together and uh, started pushing out uh, releases at a very quick pace. Um, so here's a history and origins of DevOps. Uh, I will do a shameless plug for, this is not my book, uh, but the DevOps handbook. Uh, Gene Kim and, and the rest of the individuals here back in 2010 were attending a development conference in San Francisco. Uh, they saw a talk at development, uh, basically essentially development at speed, automating development pipelines, and they, they had an epiphany. And as many of these things often do, they gathered in a bar afterwards, 
had several drinks probably, and, and came up with the concept of DevOps and all got together and, and basically wrote the DevOps handbook. Um, another great book to read as well if you're looking to get in this field is the, uh, the Phoenix Project, um, which is a story of a, of a failing project and how they got it um, back on its feet through, through continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment. Um, but as you can see, uh, you know, the, the impact of insecure or poor software releases are pretty profound. Uh, you know, when we look at companies uh, back in, you know, the mainframe days, if we wrote bad code or we had a bad release, uh, the impact could be as substantial as literally the whole company going under. If you're in a, in a tight market with fierce competition, you push out a bad release with bad features uh, that's un unstable, you run the risk of company going over. Over time, when we get to the client server, um, you know, we run the risk of product lines or divisions failing, but, you know, really, uh, the company's probably going to be secure, although the CIO will probably not be around very long. Um, and now that we're in the 2000s, uh, we're looking at, you know, the much lower cost for failure. Um, and really, we just, we're at risk as a product feature. And the, the, the cost is, is more negligible at this time. Um, so as we are able to push releases out faster in smaller increments, the impacts are smaller to the organization. Um, and arguably, less people are, are chewed out and or fired at the end of the day. Um, so let's talk about DevOps. Um, so there's kind of three core uh, tenets or philosophies of DevOps, and they all build upon each other. The first one being flow. Um, so when we build uh, software, when we develop software, and we push it out to environments, um, that is the, the, the pipeline that we're building. Flow is how can we build a pipeline that's automated, whereas a developer writes code, commits it, it never touches another human hand, um, or has any manual intervention until it rolls out to production. That's the goal of the, of the first step, uh, is flow. Uh, the next one is gonna be feedback. Um, how do we get feedback uh, from, from things that flow out? So nobody builds a CI CD pipeline or, or a software development pipeline and gets away with perfection on the first time. I don't think that happens in any field uh, in, in the IT industry or cybersecurity. Um, so how do we get that continual feedback coming back? Um, and so, uh, the, that builds once again now into the third one, the continuous experimentation and learning. Uh, so you see much more smaller feedback cycles. It's a little uh, off on the screen here, um, but a lot more smaller feedback cycles within that pipeline. So if we see an error, for example, in test, we get that immediate feedback. It's not something that we see back into production work its way back in. Um, so we're able to resolve issues faster, um, and, and get that code out more securely and, and with a better quality. Because it's not all about cybersecurity with DevOps, certainly not. Um, it's, it's about getting code out in a high quality manner. We'll talk, we'll add, we'll bake security in in a second. Um, so Agile equals DevOps, right? Uh, it's not quite. Um, so DevOps is that, that logical extension. So Agile at its core is focused primarily on the development of the software, whereas DevOps incorporates the, uh, not just the development of the software, the building of the software, but also the packaging on environments, the creation of those environments to host it for the both testing and QA environments and production, and the automation of the rollout to those environments for the testing. Um, so DevOps encompasses quite a bit more than that. Not only that, also in includes a continuous feedback. So if I'm just talking about rolling code from development all the way through production, that's technically continuous integration slash continuous uh, deployment, um, which I'll get to the next uh, slide on. But DevOps adds that continuous feedback, it can, adds that automated deployments and operations to, to Agile, and very importantly, sweet, sweet, sweet metrics. Everybody loves metrics. Most importantly, your C-suite loves metrics. Um, and if you can demonstrate increased success with every iteration of code rollout, um, you're gonna show to your, your C-suite, your directors, any executive in your organization, hey, this, this was worth the investment. Um, not only because we're getting code out more quickly, but from a business perspective, now against our competition, um, we're rolling out features before they can. Um, and that's very important, particularly in, in this hyper-aggressive you know, uh, IT industry that we find ourselves in today. Whoever gets it out to the market first generally wins. Um, that is statistically proven pretty true over time. So getting features out faster than your competition um, is, is absolutely critical. Um, so talking about CI, CD, uh, when we look at, what are, what are all the differences, right? Um, there's two CDs, which is great, because somebody couldn't come up with a different letter. Um, so continuous integration is essentially, uh, is the build process. We're getting, we're getting the code built, 
we're doing the unit testing uh, and, and we're deploying it, it to the various testing stages. Uh, continuous delivery is getting it all the way out and ready for production. However, there's a manual step of approval before it hits production. For some organizations, this works better for them. Um, given the sensitivity of the material, it depends on, on what works best for your organization. Um, whereas continuous deployment is the second that the developer hits commit, run it back into trunk, it runs to the battery of tests and rolls all the way out to production, assuming uh, it, it passes every gate. If it fails a test, obviously it doesn't make it to production. Um, so that, that's kind of obviously the premise there. Uh, so what does DevOps look like? And so, uh, and I'll be up front, the, the tools that are on here, uh, blatantly stolen from Rancher's site, obviously. Um, so there's a variety of different tools that you can use to build out a DevOps pipeline. These are just examples. Um, but for example, in, in your development phase, we, we have GitHub, we have our repository where we're storing information, um, where we're committing stuff back to trunk. Um, once a commit is made back to trunk, Jenkins, um, which is gonna be our automation software, uh, is gonna kick off that build and, and coordinate some of these other pieces. Once that build's complete, um, it goes over to Docker Hub and it gets thrown into an actual uh, OCI container. Uh, at that point, Rancher says, hey, I've got a new container that got built. It means we have new software. It's time to test. All right, let's take that container, let's stand it up on AWS. Um, or if we're using VMware, uh, locally we can stand it up there too. You do not have to use the cloud for DevOps. It sure helps. But you do not have to use the cloud for, uh, for DevOps. Um, so it deploys it out, um, it upgrades it as, as necessary, and then we get to operate. And so there's a variety of different tools that help us along the way um, to, to get to that. But what you don't see in there right now inherently is security. Um, so we need to add it, right? Um, so let's go ahead and, and, and toss security in there. And I think a lot of folks have, uh, if you're, especially if you're in the software development community, understand that, that bugs cost money. Um, you introduce a bug as a developer, you are costing your company money. It's not meant to be a dig. We all make mistakes. We all introduce bugs. Even senior developers do it all the time. Um, but what we need to do is try and remediate those issues as much as possible. And, and I'll be frank, security vulnerabilities in code are, are bugs. It's unintended functionality of the code um, that, unfortunately, in the case of a security vulnerability, results in a uh, potential uh, compromise down the road. And, and we all know how that goes. And so, depending on where you remediate the finding, so if we, we fix it in requirements and architecture, it costs almost nothing. Um, if we fix it in coding, it costs just a smidge more. But as we go down the, the pipeline all the way to production, those costs begin to increase, and not just a little bit, I'm talking exponentially, to the point where a vulnerability that could have been fixed in requirements, architecture, coding is gonna be on the scale of 25 to 30 times more expensive to resolve in production. Why? Because we have to take that, we have to either stand, re-stand back up the old uh, software or just anticipate continuing to use it, and then it becomes an all-hands-on-deck emergency. Uh, people are burning the midnight oil, we're coming in on the weekends after we're released to, to remediate issues, everyone's stressing out, uh, the CIO is pulling out his hair, um, the, the, the C-suite is, is, you know, got it, he's grinding their axe to lob off heads. Um, and so in addition to the, just the sheer cost of, of bringing it back to, uh, to development to get it done, we find ourselves in a situation where um, we've built a toxic high stress environment because um, we obviously don't want to deploy bad code to customers. That's how we make our money. We don't want to do that. Um, so we have, we have a couple different words for it. Is it DevSecOps? Is it SecDevOps? Is it DevOpsSec? Um, and you will actually find these different variants all over the web. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd say the bulk, about 80% of the community uses DevSecOps. I think it just rolls off the tongue better. But there's also kind of a mentality of what order things are going in, right? Um, development happens first, and you add security, and then it rolls out to operations, right? Um, different organizations may do things a little bit differently. Maybe we make security in before development. Um, but, but where do we integrate this? Where do we integrate security into our DevOps pipeline? And essentially everywhere, right? Um, we, can, we can integrate security into every single step of the process. That we, our industry has become that robust enough where we can actually accomplish that. Um, so first one, <clears throat> development. Development is the best place. Um, well, right after architecture, of course. You wanna make sure you architect a strong security. 
Uh, but immediately after that, where rubber meets the road and we're actually putting code down, where we introduce those SQL injection vulnerabilities, those cross-site script and cross-site request forgery, all of these vulnerabilities, um, this is the best place to do it. Because if we find the vulnerability here, it takes almost zero time to fix it. If we find it in production, um, what we found is something that's running in a rich graphical user interface. Where do we find that in the code? That's what takes that time. That's what adds that cost is, oh, God, where is this? Um, so when we, we fix it in the development phase, what we're doing is we're taking that whole piece of investigation piece out of the equation, which you know immediately where we introduced it. One of the best ways to do this is to integrate plugins into your integrated development environment. So if you're using IntelliJ or uh, Eclipse, um, you know, or, or any litany of other integrated development environments, there's ample plugins that exist out there um, where essentially as you're typing the code, if you, for example, accidentally input a, uh, you know, a SQL injection vulnerability, it's going to tell you right there. There's a little box that says, hey, you did something bad. Uh, before you commit this, fix it. Um, and you can also integrate these plugins with Jenkins. So if you attempt to uh, commit code in that has existing uh, vulnerabilities, you can get that set thresholds, high, medium, low, whatever you want it to be. Um, then it'll say, stop, don't pass go, we're going to break this, um, and you're going to fix it. Um, so you will not be able to commit your code until you fix the vulnerability. Um, what's, what's really great about it as well is when we try and implement security programs in companies, what, what often happens? Uh, resistance. Right, um, cybersecurity is, is not a, uh, it's a cost center, right? We're not generally making the company money um, unless we're a cybersecurity company, um, and, and most are not, right? So when we introduce cybersecurity into organizations, the first thing that generally happens is, Ugh, what is, what extra work do I now have to do? The beauty of integrating um, plugins into our IDEs Essentially, we're telling developers, like, you know, there's nothing more to add. You just look in the bottom left of your screen when you're done coding. Did you introduce something? Just fix it real quick. Five minutes later, we're done. Um, and the better part of it, too, is that you're educating your developers along the way as well. We're not waiting until, oh, crap, something happened out there to do the education. It's happening at this time, in addition to all the other education uh, programs that you're running at your company for cybersecurity, which we all know are, are, are beneficial. Um, so moving on, we get to our build phase. Um, SaaS tools. So you can also integrate these with your automation suite. So, uh, and, and the beauty of that is putting in gates. So for those who are not familiar with SaaS tools, these are tools that essentially scan your raw source code for vulnerabilities, um, which could be hundreds of thousands, millions of lines of code, and it tears through it looking for, uh, going through its, its heuristics and all of its signatures and looking for potential vulnerabilities in your code. Great, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, all code that is, that is written by a human being is essentially custom code. Um, unless you're using a library or framework, um, it's custom code. So to try and write signatures for every single piece of custom code on planet Earth is very difficult, resulting in, of course, false positives. Millions and millions of false positives. Um, SAS tools are important. I, I'm not trying to discourage people from using them. In fact, they are quintessential to, to the security process. Um, but we have to have a fundamental understanding that there will be a lot of false positives. Developing a program that uh, works hand in hand with the developers who wrote it to kind of mitigate those is, is kind of critical, right? You want to make sure that you are, uh, you know, you didn't write the code. You're, you're, the, you're the AppSec guy. You're probably one AppSec guy of 100 developers, which currently right now is the industry standard. 100 developers, one AppSec guy. Congratulations. Um, you are literally uh, got your finger in the dam holding the water back. Um, so if you have to work with all these different teams, that's going to be a problem. A lot of SaaS tools will allow you to kind of fine tune them over time, or if they integrate with dynamic application security testing tools, um, then you can often mitigate some of those false positives as well. Um, but the beauty of this is if I write code, somehow it gets past my IDE plugin, the SaaS scanner finds it, hey, you introduced a, um, a high SQL injection finding, um, stop, don't pass go, fix it. So the problem is now, so it's starting to cost a little bit more money now, right? We've put it through the scan, it's taken several hours, potentially depending on the size of the build, and, uh, and now I've wasted developer time waiting for that scan to finish, and now they gotta fix something and do it all again. Um, so as you see here, we're starting to add a little bit more of a headache to, to remediation. Uh, test phase, so dynamic uh, application security testing tools, uh, basically, they're, 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 they're they're testing your running software. So essentially, they'll, you'll run your application. 
um, you know, web application, this DAS tool is going to go in there and say, hey, I see this form field. Let's try some SQL injection attacks. This didn't work. Cool. No finding. They did. Problem. So uh, DAS tools are great in software development organizations because of one very important thing. They provide the proof of the vulnerability. If you go to your developer with a handful of, say, a thousand static analysis findings, um, they're going to be like, what, what is this? How many of these are false positives? Which one do I really need to concentrate on? Um, a couple of things happen. One, they're, they're apathetic to your cause, and they lose confidence in you as, a, as an application security person, right? Um, whereas dynamic application security testing is great. You go to them, it's like, hey, we ran the DAS tool against the code, and no joke, there's some cross-site and cross-forgery issues here. Um, and, and let's take a look. Now, once again, so low false positive rate, increased confidence, um, but it's now a higher cost to remediate, right? We've moved further along the pipeline. We now have an issue in a running application that we don't necessarily know where it is in the raw source code. The developer probably has a strong idea and they'll be able to find it quickly. Um, but in order to remediate it, now we remediate it back, back at step zero uh, when we're developing the code. It goes all the way back through and only until it gets to this step again will it be able to find that vulnerability. Um, so you can see how um, that, that can be an issue. I mentioned before uh, correlation with SAS findings. There are some um, application scanning tools that will do both your SAS and DAS scanning and then actually core, do their best effort to correlate the results. The beauty of that is, oh, I've got this issue here. I go back to this line and this file and fix the code there. Try it again. Done. Packaging. All right. So this is, this is some of the, the, the more newer uh, stuff that's been coming out lately. Um, obviously, we always secure our platforms. That's not new, right? Uh, you know, let's lock down Windows. Um, you know, let's remove all the uh, non-essential services from Linux, um, these sorts of efforts. Um, but now we've got containers. Oh, boy. Um, so containers are, are, are fundamentally changing the landscape of how quickly we roll out code to production environments and how effectively we're able to maintain those environments and keep them up and running. Um, so there are a couple of tools here, uh, some of the bigger names, Twistlock, um, is a paid service that mostly focuses on Docker containers and OpenSCAP, which is a scanning tool for the OCI format, which can be turned in basically essentially any container, right? So OCI format can be turned into uh, Podman, a Docker, Redshift, any of those sort of uh, containers that are out there. Um, obviously, a lot of people focus on Docker because they are the biggest name of the game. About 88% of the market, at last I looked, was Docker containers. Um, so Twistlock's about to have a, a pretty awesome year. Good on, I think it's Palo Alto who bought them. Um, and then finally we get to production. And so production here, you're going to see a, a little bit more of common, uh, more standard tools that, that we've used in the past. Um, but the biggest focus here is going to be on monitoring. Um, so, and this is really the ops piece of, of DevSecOps. Uh, we're, we're trying to find here is the app health, uh, the security of the running app, and obviously performance. Um, and performance is a security issue because if our performance is so low that users are unable to use our functionality, we've DDoSed our own application. Um, and it is positively, absolutely the worst place to find a vulnerability, and I think we all know why, it's in production. So if you see that vulnerability, so does the adversary, so does you know, somebody looking to do something malicious to your network. Um, there are a couple of tools, uh, runtime application self-protection tools um, that, that you can use that essentially live in your code and let you know um, if, it, if something's atta attempting an attack on your system, it'll give you a feedback on that. And those also integrate with the, you know, your common CM tools. Uh, LSTAC, Splunk, um, and various analytics engines like L Elasticsearch. Um, so it, it's a, and, and really that's really important too because in DevSecOps, in the ops piece of DevSecOps, you're, you're fundamentally looking at the performance of the system. You've rolled it out to production, you know it works, um, but what you're looking for is you know average uh, mean time for a user uh, to, to get results back or you know how many vulnerabilities do we find along the way. Um, that sort of thing, so we can, can do continuous improvement. Once again, it goes, it talks back to that third, second and third phase of feedback and continuous education, right, uh, in, the, in the DevOps way. Um, so when we do all that, um, we, we come back to our, our CI CD pipeline. Same one I showed before, but now I've added all these gray tools at the top. Um, so Ripstech uh, integrates in your IDEs, Veracode, um, you know, and once again, example companies, it could be any of them. These are just ones that I was able to Google first. But Veracode, well, actually I've used all these, but so Veracode, um, you'll find, can do both the SAST and DAST. Many other tools do that as well now. It's not just singular to, I'm not trying to single out a single company. Um, you'll say we're using Docker Hub, 
twist lock is probably what we're going to want to use uh, for this environment. And then Splunk down the line uh, to give us our, our logging and feedback from those running systems, right? Um, but, you know, obviously all of this costs money. So I found the free version. Um, as with any open source freeware tools, these uh, are not as generally capable as the open source tools. They require a little bit more work on your end to set up and configure and maintain. But if you're a small company and you want to set up a DevOps pipeline, there's certainly ways to do it. Um, so, you know, you've got fine security bugs uh, in the left hand corner. There's an integration predominantly focused on Java, I might add. Um, for your development phase, uh, Sonar Cube is, is a QA and security tool that you can integrate in the build phase. Um, we've got Claire for packaging. Um, oh, everyone knows the OWASP app symbol, right? So we've got that for, for our testing phase. We've got running environments. Um, we got Falco for the deployment upgrade phase, and of course, Elasticsearch on, on the operation end um, for our metrics reporting. Um, so once we all integrate all these pieces in, um, we, we finally get this, this glorious DevSecOps environment where we are able to produce code, roll it out into our build, test, QA environments, and out to production and monitor the health and security of it, we've reached this panacea of DevSecOps. Everything is, is going great. Um, you know, people are, are working together. We've got teams that, that are, are happier. Uh, we've got operations that support security. We've got security that supports our developers and likewise back up the food chain. Um, and we got continuous feedback. So what are everybody in the entire pipeline and basically this factory of development um, has, has become now is, is one more unified team core focused on, on this technology. Um, but what about manual testing, right? Um, it, it's still a thing. So manual testing still exists, right? Um, we, we can't uh, ignore the fact that automation can, can, can get us a pretty far, but not all the way. Um, so we try and minimize it though. So if you have a man, essentially in DevSecOps, the objective is if you have a manual repeatable process, we're at the point in history where you can code it and just have it repeat itself. Um, so one of the one of the kind of founding tenets of DevOps in the past was uh, was manufacturing. If you know you have a repeatable process, if I am putting a tire on a car and screwing the lug nuts on, um, does a person have to screw every single one on, or can I have a machine do all five at once, which is what happens now? Um, and so a lot of Dev DevOps functionality or DevOps philosophy is built around um, some of these these core tenets. Um, the biggest one being the, the Toyota manufacturing process, believe it or not. Um, so for, for those who don't know the history, um, Toyota's kind of surge uh, in, in power and, and eminence and, and really reliability um, kind of came around from the, this process where as a car is moving down the line, they did immediate feedback in the process. Remember those little tiny loops in the process? That's what Toyota was doing. Um, as a Toyota you know, wheel putter on her, if I felt that something could be improved, there is no joke, a red cord above my station, I could pull it and it will notify um, somebody to come over. Or if something broke, if something broke, pull a red cord, manager comes over, if within 30 seconds they can't resolve the issue, the entire simulator line shuts down um, and it gets fixed. Does it sound familiar? It sounds like the software development pipeline. And so uh, what we've done now is, is we've taken all those repeatable processes of manufacturing, we're building a widget here um, all the way to the end. We have a raw source material, which is our code, and we're building out this, this beautiful car down, down at the end of the line. Um, so that, that really should be the focus. If there's something that can be automated, automate it. It makes your job easier. Um, it makes the pipeline go faster um, and allows you to focus more on, on some other core things. Like for example, it's very hard to automate all of pen testing. We know this because you know, we have to write custom code, right? Um, so there will still certainly be manual penetration testing, but you're minimizing the amount of manual effort that you have to do in your organization to do it. Um, and then we also have secure architecture design. No one's going to be able to push a button and say, build me a secure architecture done. Um, no, we, that's why we, we, we pay, you know, uh, networking companies millions of dollars to do that stuff for us, right? But, so there's always going to be a human piece to, to this pie, but minimizing as much as possible is, is, is certainly the objective. Um, so just, just kind of a, a quick overview, benefits of DevSecOps, enhances that security testing automation, we're not doing it manually, I'm not running a SAS scan and eight hours later, you know, shoving the results over on my dev team and having to suffer through it, it's running continuously. Ideally, you've got a SAS scanner that does incremental scanning, just checks for the small changes, 
and that way they just get a small little plate of vulnerabilities they need to find. Um, it shifts focus from that manual evalu evaluation to refined automation, uh, which of course over time saves money. So the less people I have with their, their hands in the pot, humans are prone to error. Um, I think we all know this. Um, so any time that I have manual intervention in my DevOps pipeline, I'm also potentially introducing bugs, vulnerabilities, flaws um, in, in the code. Um, obviously, we discuss how it saves money over the long term. Standing up a DevOps pipeline in the beginning can, can be a, a little bit of a, a shift because you're probably going to keep some of those more legacy pipelines built in place until that DevOps pipeline is stood up, which means you're buying the tools and products to get it there and also the people um, to kind of coordinate this effort. But you don't need a lot of people for DevSecOps, um, truly uh, uh, just a few because what the DevOps team is really going to be focused on is bringing other teams together. You're not building a brand new DevSecOps team. What you're essentially building is a, uh, an organization that's just working more closely together. Um, obviously, the higher quality, more secure and faster code deployment, and then getting it out to the market first. Um, I cannot stress that enough. One of the biggest reasons uh, while, why Facebook or, and, and Amazon and Netflix have become very successful companies is because as customer demand for features is fed back to them, they're the first of the market to get it back out. Uh, they don't wait. They don't wait a, a month or two or three months. Um, they literally wait. Uh, they, they're not waiting that time at all. They're waiting hours, and that new code is out in production, fully functional, secure, and been tested against the whole battery of tests, all the way down to unit testing. Um, so really, that's at the, at the crux of the issue. That, that's what we're looking at there. So with that said, that, that concludes my presentation. Um, I have a... Unfortunately, way too much time for, for questions, um, but more than happy to take them. So if anybody ha has any questions, feel free to, uh, no, no question. All right, we're in the back. Well, I've had a bunch of questions for you. Oh, questions. no. Um, so, so the question was, how do we, uh, how do we convince our developers that, you know, to, to start looking at these false positives and comb through them and, and find out which ones are true, right? Um, and and that is, it, that's actually a really great question because uh, a lot of us deal with that, that that are in the AppSec field. How do you get, how do you convince your developers to it? A, a big piece of it is actually for your AppSec team, it does benefit them to have development experience in their background. Um, you know, so for, I'll, I'll take me for example. I'm a computer science major. Um, do not ask me to code anything beyond just some basic scripting stuff. I can read code all day, I can understand code, um, and I'll understand what it's doing, um, and I can find the flaws in it. But what I can't do is um, say, hey, build me a, a rich web application that does this, this from end to end. I'm not a full stack developer. Um, at the end of the day, what, what I found is, is the best method to resolve this. Be, uh, before, I'll give an example. I started a company, um, they had a, a a somewhat older tool that was doing their SAS scanning, right? They got it on a, a license very early in the SAS scanner's uh, inception as a company, and they got a great deal on it, and they stuck with that deal, even though the tool and capability continued to improve to reduce the false positive rate, um, add more functionality, and uh, just generally scale with the organization. But they refused to pay more because I think they were somewhere, I don't know, ballpark $10,000 a year. It was cheap. And we were scanning millions of lines of code millions. Um, so scans would generally take 24 to 40 hours. So first issue, how do I build a pipeline if my scans take 24 to 48 hours to complete um, scanning against a monolithic application? You know, if I tell a developer, hey, you need to wait uh, a day for me to get these results back. Oh, by the way, you know, uh, I think we calculated 93% of them are going to be false positives. 93%. And, and by and large, a lot of SAS scanners are are not a whole lot, even the, the high performers are a whole lot below that. I mean, I think we're looking at 50, 60 for the best. Um, creme de la creme, paying out the nose for them. Um, so when I take this pile of false positives to, to the developers, that was the feedback I got. Uh, and that was a good learning lesson for me too. It's like, wow, I, you know, they're right. I'm asking them to look at this pile of junk and find the gems in, in the desert essentially, right? Um, so, so one of the things that, 
that we ask them to do is, is sit down and explain, hey, we can refine the tool. Um, and as long as we have a fundamental understanding of why these are false positives, then we can move forward and refine the tool and do that. Um, also, as I get results, even if the tool refinement doesn't work, I can do an initial parsing through these findings and, and minimize as much as possible. Um, there are some false positives that even junior developers can't find, um, or junior mid-level developers, only senior developers who maybe wrote that code, would be able to say, yeah, but it's really not a, a finding because we have this uh, mitigating effect several you know, steps up. A good uh, SAS tool will look at um, the, the connective tissue in the code, essentially. So I've got this, uh, I got this function here, and it does a function call higher up, and another function, another function, another function, and at the top of that stack, it has that protection there. You know, it, it does the input validation at the very top um, of, of that assessment process. And so that, uh, in, in the eyes of the developer, and depending on the organization, it mitigates that false positive. But we don't know that until we look all the way up it. So a lot of it comes down to the education of the AppSec engineer who's working the, the issues um, and the developer who actually wrote the code. So um, it is it's a difficult thing to figure out. Um, there, one of the ways that I try to mitigate that was, was through education. So um, one of the nice things about the SAS scanner is like, hey, these are, these are injection findings. This is cross-site scripting findings. Um, you got reflected cross-site scripting here, but it categorized them. So one of the uh, steps I took in that organization was to say, okay, I'm, we've got a mountain of, well, we had a mountain of tech debt, start with that. Um, but we also have a mountain of technical security debt. And let's, let's take, you know, you don't, you don't eat an elephant in one bite, right? You eat it one bite at a time. And so what it is like, all right, so next month, uh, let's say January 1st. Uh, I'm no, not first, that's, you're all gonna be hungover. January 2nd, um, <laughs> January 2nd, um, we're gonna have a, a class. We're gonna have a, a brown bag. And even better, if you can get the company to buy pizza because God will developers show up for pizza. You could, you could put pizza down for like the worst thing. Everybody's gotta get their flu shots, uh, but hey, there's pizza and you get the whole company there. Um, and we're gonna sit down, we're gonna have a brown bag about injection findings. And so what I did is I, I gathered everyone in the room, went over injection findings, but most importantly, uh, I, stood up, I stood up an OWASP Matilda Day server in the room that anyone could log into, um, it was Matilda Day 2, sorry, um, and allowed them to actually test SQL injection attacks on that vulnerable server just to show them what the impact of this vulnerability was. So they got to see uh, SQL injection uh, vulnerabilities, command injection vulnerabilities, basically the, the plethora of injection vulnerabilities that do exist, but have one very simple solution, is input validation, um, and they had a more fundamental understanding. At that point I said, hey, over the next six months, we're gonna clean out all of the injection findings in our code, and once it's down to zero on the, on the uh, last scan at six months, we're closing the door. So anytime that there is another scan and we find an injection finding, we're gonna break the build. It's gonna go back to you, you're gonna fix it, and your code does not pass go. And that is by order of the, the CISO, CEO, and, and that's how that would work. So that was one of the ways that we kinda of made it a little bit of a forcing function, but if you ignore your code for a long time, you're gonna have a much bigger mountain. Uh, if you get that mountain down to flat earth, zero vulnerabilities, and over a couple of weeks maybe get five or six more, that's a lot easier for developers to chew on um, instead of handing them a mountain of them uh, at a, in a brand new scheme, so. You had another question? Um, that was, you Okay, I tend to blather on. Right. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, question. You were talking about automating, and, and sometimes in testing of DevOps, there's parts of the flow with the MySQL script as well that didn't have that Jenkins and the process orchestrator. Um, you need like a site reliability engineer, like this Google concept, where like somebody that can just go and fix that script Yes. Is, is that role being emphasized more in coming out of Google as a common practice in other firms? I haven't seen it as much of a common practice. I have heard of it. Um, so it, it, the difficulty is, is that you generally when you're running into organizations that are transitioning to DevSecOps, they are finding themselves on the back of their heels already and trying to catch up to the industry. Um, and at the same time, don't have the investment potential that Google does to, to bring people in. Um, so most of the time when I've joined organizations that are trying to stand up dev, DevOps or DevSecOps in particular, they're grabbing existing bodies and say, go educate yourself and bring it back, let's stand it up. Um, so the, the reliability, you know, the position that could best be described as reliability engineers organizations I've been working with is that senior dev who um, 
who also has spent time on the, on the platform team, on, on the uh, architecture team, um, who kind of has a fundamental understanding, a couple echelons above their level of what could break and what needs to be fixed. Um, that person tends to be paid very well and get burned out real fast. Um, so having that, that site reliability engineer is, I, I think, I have to agree, is actually a really critical position. So, um, and to make sure I'm capturing this, the question was, um, do you see value in, in reliability engineers being part of the DevOps process? So, uh, any other questions? Oh, question, sorry. Um, so the question was, uh, in, in my experience, what are some of the best practices to transition from a DevOps pipeline and, and, and uh, culture to a DevSecOps culture? Um, and, and it's a great question uh, because it's like, I mean, and frankly, it's probably similar to many of our other experiences where we try and integrate security to anything in our organization. Immediate resistance. Why do we really need to do this? Um, we're adding more overhead. Um, what, why are we doing this? And at the end of the day, um, the, beauty of, the beauty of going to DevOps is that you've automated all the processes. Um, you've taken a lot of the work out of uh, not just the developer's hands, uh, but also your, your systems or operations team, whichever you, you call, flavor you call it. Um, and, and you've basically taken what would have taken months to weeks to days to potentially hours and minutes to actually accomplish. So when you introduce uh, security into a DevOps pipeline to make it DevSecOps, you're, you're not significantly introducing a lot more effort, or at least you shouldn't be, um, because you're gonna be automating a lot of these pieces. Now, obviously the, the pen testing, the pieces at the end may still have to occur, either by regulatory requirements um, or whatever that, that looks like. Um, and that can't necessarily be changed. Um, but if I'm adding, like say for example, find security bugs, um, if I went to my leadership and said, hey, I want to scan our code for, AppSec or for application vulnerabilities every day, give the feedback to the developers, you know, and, and have meetings with them, God, more meetings you have, the less development happens. Um, but if I need to have a meeting with them to discuss these findings, that's a problem. Leadership's going to push back on that. It's like, well, no, you're wasting our developers' time. Their time is very precious as it is. Um, it's, and if you're a software development company, it's your core resource. Um, so any little thing that I introduce needs to have the most minimal impact to developers. And that's why um, I was kind of uh, foot stomping a bit on the IDE integration. Anything I can do for my developers to see the issue at the beginning is, is super beneficial. Um, education, I know we, we, we say that in just about every cybersecurity talk, um, from you know, phishing attacks to all the way down the line, but education is important too. And there's a different education for developers, right? If I'm educating an HR person on how to stop a phishing attack, yeah, a developer needs to know that too, but a developer needs to know a good bit more. My HR person doesn't need to know how to you know, resolve a cross-site scripting vulnerability, but by golly, my developer really needs to. Um, and so there, there's a secondary education that needs to take place. The more educated your developers are about insecure coding practices or using insecure frameworks or using outdated struts too, like a particular company did, and lost all of our personal data related to our credit, um, then the, that, that's really kind of the crux of what we're trying to do here is get, uh, is get our developers better educated. So they're writing more secure code. There is some initial investments in that up front of time, of course, but as it pertains to the pipeline, if I've automated the SAS scanning, if I've automated um, the IDE plugins, if I've automated the DAS scanning, those are all, at this point in time, without DevOps, manual processes. I have to schedule it Right? I have to wait for a new environment to be stood up. Is QA done testing so we don't DOS our own QA environments when I uh, hit it with the DAS scanner? Um, and then what's my timeline to get results back? Do I put it in the sprint iterations? Do I add it to their, their backlog? But So if you have an agile development environment and you add dev op, DevOps, you've already got a very flowing organization already, and then you just are squeaking a little bit of security incrementally at a time. Um, Leadership, I think, fundamentally understands that security is, at this day and age, a necessity, but it is a cost center. It costs the company money. So the min most minimal impact we can have, the better. And if, if that is just something as simple as that free IDE plugin, well, that's a win. I'll take that. And then we'll talk about the SAS and DAS scanners down the line um, because they'll likely cost money. So um, 
it's, it's like anything with security. As long as you minimize the impact to the actual money bringer enders, which is your developers, they, they, they produce for the company, they produce product that rolls out production that brings company money, minimize the impact to them and, and you'll, I think you'll see success. That's what I've seen. Thank you. Uh, question. Perfect. Um, so but there's a lot of metrics you can grab, right? And it's going to depend on what your leadership wants to see. But uh, so the question was, what metrics do your senior leadership want to see in the organization? I got to make sure I capture this. Um, the biggest things they're going to want to see, believe it or not, are, are not explicitly tied to generally security. Um, the, secure, the, the CISO is going to care about that, right? Um, the leadership will care about it for they'll see the value uh, or the, the minimization of impact to their organization. But what your, leader, what your C, COO is going to want to look for is essentially, hey, mean time for idea of, of a tool or a feature, the feature you know, spark of interest from the start of the organization to production. Um, average mean time of uh, downtime in production. Uh, they're going to want to, so you know, those metrics of, you know, Amazon has a 99.999999% uptime, I think it's somewhere around there. Um, and by golly, if it goes to 99.9997, then somebody's getting fired. Um, those are the kind of the things they want to look for. They're, they're looking for that, that mean uptime, um, reducing any available downtime as much as humanly possible. Um, and then minimizing the amount of environments they have to stand up. So the, mo the least amount of environments you have to stand up, that saves you money. If I'm paying for you know, EC2 instances in Amazon and I have to stand up like 300 of them to get my application running, um, but I found a way in, in DevOps to minimize that and then that pipeline down to 250, that's cost savings to the company. Um, and if I can keep it as minimal as possible, let's say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a toy maker and have a website that, that uh, needs to scale dramatically right around Black Friday, um, then you know, I've got an opportunity there to keep my cost at a minimum until, of course, the big day, but then also only scale when it's necessary. And with beauties of DevOps, really robust DevOps programs, um, so we're talking, you know, Netflix is a great example, right? Um, uh, let's say they, they come out with uh, Stranger Things 4. It's, it's on 4 now, I think. Stranger Things 4 comes out. What's immediately going to happen that night uh, to, to bandwidth requirements at Netflix? It's just going to just scream through the roof. Um, and so what Netflix has done is they built a, they, they have their own built uh, homegrown tool that is free, 50 free. I highly recommend it called Spinnaker. And it is your uh, S-P-I-N-N-A-K-E-R. And it essentially takes your code from the second it is built and done in the, that test process and runs it all the way through to production owned. Oh, by the way, it'll automate scaling for you as well. Um, so it'll work hand in hand with your, your, your load balancers and everything, um, and as well as your AWS instances, to, if, if that's so, so the case, to scale your servers, um, any sort of other instances that you have in the cloud appropriately based on that feedback. So, hey, this, the server is at 75% capacity, boom, stamp another one. Um, it's at, this one just hit 80% capacity in three minutes, stand up five more real fast as we're scaling pretty quickly. So, um, it allows the organization to minimize like that, so. Oh, one take a question here. Uh, as a student, how would you, uh, what source would you Boop, 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 boop. Boom, that bad boy right there, the DevOps handbook, um, as well as the uh, Phoenix project. So those are kind of the quintessential uh, Bibles in the process. There's a, a lot of the companies are, are freely putting out information of their successes with this. So Netflix is a great one. Um, Netflix is, they, they built a series of tools to help them in the DevOps, and they've made those available for anyone to use, which is really amazing. Um, for free 53, too, which is the best way to do it. Um, but if you're looking at, um, you know, how do, how do I break into this, this environment or this field, um, you know, the, that, that IT background from your education is, is a big piece of it, right? Um, understanding full stack development is really important. Um, what pieces go into this web application? What parts, what's, what are the phases of development? Um, and, and how does that, that all work? Um, the other big piece too, hmm, excuse me, is understanding systems. Um, so when we stand in, in, oh man, at your point in time where you're in your career, you've got to dive into containers because um, they are, they're coming fast and furious. Um, you know, you can stand up a VM um, and consume this many resources on a server and stand up three or four 
you know, VMs on that server if they're robust, of course. Uh, but inside each of those VMs, I could stand up five or six Docker containers because they're only using the core resources that they need inside of the operating system. Um, so containers are extremely lightweight. I can stand up a, you know, a, a Ubuntu container in, in seconds. Um, it, it's extremely quick because it's only pulling the resources it absolutely needs to do its core functionality. Um, so focus on containers. Container security um, is, is a big piece. Uh, so if you're jumping into this field, that is rapidly becoming a very big concern for a lot of companies because as any new technology, someone's going to find a way to exploit it and they already have started, uh, started to. So um, if you actually go out there, you'll, you'll find there's quite a few container security positions um, that are being looked at in addition to cloud security. So understanding the various cloud environments, AWS, Azure, um, I guess Oracle's still a thing. Um, they still have a cloud. Um, so um, understanding how those various cloud components work with each other and the security of them too. Um, you know, what are the security groups? How does, how does Amazon handle security groups differently than Microsoft? Um, I think it'd be actually be interestingly surprised that despite the smaller market share, Microsoft has a very robust product. So um, does that answer your question? Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No? No? Excellent. All right. Uh, thank everyone for, for coming out today. I appreciate it and I uh, hope uh, you're able to take some away. Thank you.